Welcome to Talking Politics. Uh, today, we have the honor of having a well-known veteran journalist, Kun Sudi Chai Jun, who will share with us his thoughts on the current political situation, which is getting more and more exciting, and of course, it's still full of suspense. And of course, we'll try to look forward and to see what will happen next. Kun Sudi Chai, thank you very much for joining the program. Most welcome. Thank you for having me. Okay. As a veteran journalist uh, whose career spans over more than five decades, I believe, right? Yeah. I'm sure you must have seen all the ups and downs of Thai politics. Mm -hmm. As they say, you have seen the best of time, the worst of time, right? right. And that means that nothing should surprise you anymore, right? No, not really. Yeah, but of course, uh, what we are facing today is quite extraordinary, mm -hmm. right? We have a, a new generation of politicians on the verge of taking power. And then we see how the country's major establishments are being challenged mm. in a way we have never seen before. And then the old guard, mm. the conservative forces, are refusing to give up power. Right. So how would you describe this situation we are in now? Some people say this is a clash of civilizations, <laughs> which I believe, you know... Thai, Thai style. Thai style, <laughs> which I believe is quite accurate in describing what is happening now. You see new politics you see the big surprise outcome of the election. The Gao Gai Party or the Move Forward Party, they themselves were surprised by the overwhelming support they got. Most of us expected Gao Gai to do well, but not that well. <laughs> At the same time, Pua Thai Party, which I think in this case represents the old politics okay. now, which is quite surprising to you because not so long ago, Pua Thai was supposed to be the progressive party. Yeah, yeah. Suddenly, I think because of information technology and also the emergence of new mindset among the young people yeah. about politics. Even the, the real powers that be behind Pua Thai Kun Taksin Chinawat, yes. the former prime minister was himself surprised. Right. right. <laughs> he was saying that we are too old for that. Uh -huh. And he himself admitted that he should be stepping back. So I think this is a very crucial moment. It is a real transition. Of course, in a tr any transition, there will be turbulence. Mm -hmm. So we can expect a lot of unusual happenings, which we see now with the upcoming election of this House Speaker. Uh -huh. Uh -huh which even among the two major parties, which call themselves the democratic progressive uh, group, cannot agree among themselves. That's because you have old politics in the Pua Thai Party. They still have factions. Yeah, this will turn out to be a real test, whether these two parties can work together long term or not, right? Right. This is the first major test. If they cannot overcome this test, then the litmus test will be when they talk about cabinet seats. Then I think that will be the first major hurdle. The real test will be in whether Pita can really get elected as prime minister. Oh, in that's house. even the bigger test for Pita, right? Yeah, that will be the, yeah, yeah. the, the ultimate most, test. The <laughs> ultimate test. And in the end, Pita may not make it. I, okay. I, I suspect. I think at the moment there is a. 70, 30 percent chances of him not getting elected. Okay. But then, move forward, party still there. So new politics will not go away. And don't forget, they have a very big group of supporters yeah. who are active on social media, on all the social media platforms, That's and right, they yeah. will become a very strong support line mm -hmm. or check and balancing uh, Pua Thai Party and also Gao Gai Party themselves. So it's getting very interesting and I think whether the transition will work or not will be tested this time. Yeah, okay. Kun Sun Chai, do you see any parallel in the recent Thai history that is comparable to what we are seeing now? Because the fears now is that uh, if Kun Pita doesn't make it for whatever reason, then you can expect his supporters millions of them to take to the streets, and then that would probably ignite mm -hmm. a collision between mm -hmm. the, uh, the Pita supporters and the conservative forces, mm -hmm. and the military would eventually mm -hmm. would be forced to intervene. And that, that's something that, if, if, if I'm right, I mean, mm -hmm. back in the mid-70s, right, right after the 
student-led mm -hmm. uprising that overthrew the Tanom uh, regime. Mm -hmm. Only three years after that, I mean, there was a major coup d'etat preceded by the bloodbath at Thammasat University. Yes. So people are afraid that history may repeat itself. There are fears. I heard a few um, politicians and yeah. also academics expressing fear that history might repeat itself. Mm. October 14, 1973, yeah. after only three years, yeah. then you have October 6, 1976. Mm. But things are not exactly the same. After October 14, I was covering it, yeah. and I could still feel the atmosphere of excitement that we were entering a new era of politics. It was short-lived. Mm. That's because the military was still very much in control. And don't forget, there was no social media at the time. Information only went through government channels, except for the newspapers, which were reasonably independent. Yeah. Mm. But then newspapers were limited in its power at the time. But now it's different. Yeah. Now, if there's any attempt to try to undercut the democratic process in the House and impose a drastic change through another military coup, mm. then I'm sure there will be riot, there will be chaos. Mm. And I don't think anyone thinking or plotting a possible coup could underestimate the mm. power of new politics. So I hope this will not happen. I hope that the group that were, you know, the outgoing government, the coalition, yep. and the new coalition, which was the opposition, <laughs> and they got together 72% of the votes, yep, yep. both party lists and the constituencies. So they have the legitimacy to govern the country. If there are any dirty tricks or any attempt at trying to undermine the process, I don't think it would be as easy as in 1976. Yeah. And you know what happened after 1976? The country was drawn back decades yeah, before yeah. we could come back again for another election. And then that vicious cycle will come back to haunt Thailand again. Don't forget that we are in an era where the whole world watches us and That's true. Yeah. influence from outside is much more impactful than in 1976. That's right. mm. But uh, I see an irony here back mm. in the 70s. Mm the liberal forces that emerged after the October 14 uprising were accused of being pro-communist, right? Right. But this time around, the winning party in the election, uh, Gao Klai Party, is being accused of pro-West, right? <laughs> it's a great paradox. <laughs> it's a huge paradox. And, and that could be used as an excuse by those who are against the Gao Klai Party, against yes. Bita, I mean, to uh, come back and, and, and do something terrible that we uh, mm. don't want to see, as you just mentioned, that right. there are there are sort of uh, attempts to build up some kind of uh, mm -hmm. frustrations mm -hmm. uh, on this particular aspect of uh, uh, mm -hmm. the Gao Klai Party. Mm -hmm. And then we have been hearing these charges of uh, Gao Klai Party advocating a policy that would pave the way for the U.S. to intervene in Thai domestic politics. Right. <laughs> but I'd like to point out to people who think along that line that Thailand welcoming American bases only under the military government. Mm. In fact, it was a civilian government that decided that the Americans should leave. Yeah, yeah. It was under Tanam Kitika John that the American bases were put inside Thailand. It was the Kukri government, the civilian government, that decided that Americans should leave. So it is not likely that a civilian government under Pua Thai and Gao Klai would welcome American bases. Well, in fact, in the past eight years, under General Prayut Jan Ol Shah, this Thai government has been very close to the Americans. We have Cobra Gold exercise every year, even during the coup, after the coup, although they scaled it down. Yeah, that's right, yeah. yeah, yeah. But it has, it has continued until today. At the same time, the new wave of young people who now help Kunpita with foreign affairs, those who are 
working on options, foreign policy options, are telling me that they have to rebalance. Mm. They know the danger of being seen as siding with either the American side or the Chinese side. So I understand that Peter has been talking to the Chinese ambassador at the same time, you know, seeing the American ambassador. And don't forget that these young people who are working on the new platform on mm -hmm. foreign policy have been educated either in America and also some of them are studied in China. And they are together now forming a new foreign policy under a new, total new ecosystem, yeah, international right. standards. In fact, if you were to worry about more American influence, you should worry about the Prayut government in the past <laughs> eight years. You've seen the buying F-35 yeah, jet planes. Yeah. Seeking to buy them. But yeah, seeking to buy them, but not <laughs> the, I don't think they have the green light yet. Uh, at the same time, they've been very close to the Americans. Mm -hmm. And at the same time, they are seen also to be too close to China. Yeah. So the fact that we have a uh, foreign minister, Kun Don, who uh, seems not to be able to communicate to, with the public too clearly uh, of not showing Thailand being independent, I think it's more dangerous than a new party under very close scrutiny by the international community and by the media, by academics. They will be very careful. And I don't think that any government from now will welcome American bases or to allow Americans to put up military installations that would offend the Chinese. The Chinese also want to be very close to uh, the new government. Let me remind you that during the, the Burmese government under Aung San Suu Kyi, before Aung San Suu Kyi, before the election in Myanmar, the Chinese were only talking to the military side. Yeah. But the Chinese have improved a lot in their diplomatic approaches. As soon as Aung San Suu Kyi was elected, or her party was elected, a government, and Myanmar became democratic, the Chinese were very close to Aung San Suu Kyi. Mm -hmm. Aung San Suu Kyi That's went true. to visit China yeah. many times. So the Chinese, if there is a civilian government, which is now being formed, uh, is seen to be more progressive, mm -hmm. more open, more democratic, Believe me, the Chinese will be the first group of yeah. diplomats to talk <laughs> to the new government. Uh, yeah, that, I think that will, will certainly happen because we believe that Chinese have uh, sort of uh, have been taking a modern new approach in dealing yeah. with, uh, with uh, countries that uh, they're seen that they're allies, right? Yes. Yeah. And that, that, I think that, that's something that we can expect. The Chinese mm. would not be sitting still. No, they seeing won't. Seeing Thailand moving more and more toward the Americans. They right? won't. The Chinese have also uh, rebalanced their, their <laughs> own relationship. <laughs> They would not allow the Americans yeah. to be too close to the new government. Yeah, definitely. In you mentioned uh, the new foreign uh, policy direction mm -hmm. being adopted by uh, the, the Move Forward Party. Yes. And this is something that has been making a lot of headlines because uh, we just, uh, you just mentioned that uh, it is seen as moving Thailand closer to the U.S. And this is something that has stirred up some kind of uh, mm -hmm. uproar mm -hmm. among the many critics of the uh, Move Forward Party. Yes. And that reflects the concerns of many people that the country will be soon in the hands of new-faced politicians, yeah. described as uh, politicians with unknown qualities. <laughs> right? <laughs> right. Whether you like it or not, it could be good, I mean, unknown quality. Right. Because because in the past, when after election, we would know exactly who would be in power uh -huh. and what kind of direction they would take in running the country, right? right. But this time around, these are all newcomers, right. no experience in running the government. So mm -hmm. is there any parallel in history that, that, uh, that, that is comparable to what we are seeing? No, in Thailand, this would be the first time that if there is the, this government led by Move Forward Party, that it would be the first time Thailand would have some new faces, mm -hmm. new approaches, and new way of communicating with the public. I don't think it's bad. I think it's a challenge, and we cannot get any worse. Mm -hmm. I think Thailand's standing in the international community has been plunging. We have come under the international radar for a long time. Mm -hmm. 
our role, even in ASEAN, as you can see, in the past decade, has been almost non-existent. Of course, the foreign ministry claims that this is quiet diplomacy, but we are too quiet, mm. because quiet diplomacy can be active. You don't have to say things, you have, but have, you have to do things. So in a way, I think that having this new blood, a new approach to foreign policy and also domestic policies, I think is what we badly need. And look at the outcome of the election. Yes. Most of the faces were unknown, the candidates of uh, Move Forward Party. Right. I don't think Kulpita can remember all the names no. of his successful candidates, right? No, I don't <laughs> think he, he, he knows all the faces. And the voters didn't know and didn't care who they were. But they cared about the main policies. That if this party is going to offer hope, offer new hope, mm -hmm. then they're going to go for it. That's why I think that if they get that trust, that mandate, that legitimacy, then they have the right to run the country. Well, we have to keep a close eye on them. Definitely, yes. Yeah. yeah. But don't forget that these young people also are trying to learn from those old guard. I, I know that Pita has been seeing a lot of senior former diplomats, former politicians for personal consultation. I know that he has met Kun uh, Tet Bunna. He has met Kun Asa Asarasin. Wow. He has met Kun Anand. He has talked to ambassadors from the mm. West and from the East. And the team, the team have been closely lobbying or having private discussions with people from mm. the whole spectrum of people. So they are not naive, <laughs> and they're not totally new, new faces. Yeah. Uh, the MPs of Move Forward Party have had four years of experience in the, in the House. And look at the performance. I think the performance shows that they have done their homework, they know how to use data to mm. analyze the needs. And in the background, one of the reasons of their success is that they went down to every detail of each constituency. Mm -hmm. When they come out to talk about national issues, they have all the numbers. They have all the background of a story. Mm -hmm. Unlike the old politicians, <laughs> who mostly went on rhetoric, right? That's right. Yeah, you remember? Yeah. Without going into details or mm -hmm. making any concrete, uh, have any concrete plans how to solve problems uh, yes. facing the country. Yeah. The other day, I saw Kun Chalam, Yubam Rung, who went to the house for the first time in many, yeah, many yeah. years, right? And same old Chalam. Yes, yeah, same old Chalam. <laughs> and he said, I'm going to reclaim my title as the star of the house. <laughs> and I was, I was thinking, this is very interesting comparison. Yeah. Yeah. I look at the Gao Kai Party candidate who is quite outspoken as well. We wrote. We wrote. Yeah, yeah. I look at We wrote, I look at Kun Chalam, and I see We wrote maybe in a way similar to Chalam, but a with, bit, with a big difference. With more substance. With more substance. <laughs> with, a, with a big difference. And that is that he offers suggestions, um, solutions. Whether it's going to work or not is another thing. But we don't see all politicians having this kind of substance, having this kind of real information or proposed solutions to issues. Yeah. They can only rouse people up. They can talk in a way that uh, people like because you know it hit the nail on the head. But they yeah. offer no solutions. Yeah. Yeah. So I hope these new politicians, having been elected by the people with a different kind of expectation, yes. mm -hmm. will, will understand that they should not copy the old politicians in the same old way of getting popularity through rhetoric, but make sure that there will be results to prove what they say. Now, if we see how the Kun Pita uh, has been greeted by his uh, supporters and fans, uh, mm -hmm. wherever he goes to thank the, his supporters for the mm -hmm. election, the victory, mm -hmm. we can say that this is, we are living in the age of uh, Pita fever, right? Yeah. But this is not something unprecedented. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Back in the early 2000s, we had 
ทักษิณฟีเวอร์ remember that right yeah. คุณทักษิณ was as popular as คุณพิธา is now yes and the same thing seems to be happening that is that the media mm-hmm. have gone overboard mm-hmm. in giving them unquestioning uh, right. coverage news coverage right. very favorite I mean favorable the mm-hmm. coverage without raising real mm-hmm. questions mm-hmm. and of course we know what happened back then during คุณทักษิณทักษิณสถาน he used his political clout mm-hmm. and business power mm-hmm. uh, to Win over the media, right? That's true. That's and true. Many media outlets just play along either willingly or unwillingly. Right. And many did so out of uh, mm-hmm. a business uh, reason because the, the country, the media, mm-hmm. business as well, were just recovered from the financial crisis in the 1997, right? Sure. So what have we learned from that? That, that, that so that we, we, the media, will not be sort of uh, seduced into sort of uh, playing a a role that. Does not uh, conform with the, mm-hmm. the expectation of the people being mm-hmm. a watchdog. Mm-hmm. Well, I think you have to distinguish between the conventional media and the social media. Mm-hmm. Social media obviously take sides, and they sh- show very clearly who, whose side they are on. But the conventional media will have to play that professional role, mm-hmm. and that is as you suggested, that media should not be used by. Fads by short-lived mm-hmm. sort of phenomenon, which we learned in the past, t a k s i n j a m l o n g s a m a k and even as late as k u n c h a t h a t even mm-hmm. one year after he was elected governor, people say, "What? What is great about him? When <laughs> it was really a fever, he got yeah, o- o- right. over a million votes from the and, Bangkok and Kings." He received a blanket uh, news coverage by the media during his campaign, right? That's right. Yeah. Mm. So Peter's fever will also fall into the same category. Mm. The media should be more critical, should investigate more of what he says and what he does, and also the whole party. I think the whole party is quite new. If you talk to them individually, you will see that they are still learning, but they have that determination, they have that direction, the drive, which are very important for politicians. But at the same time, they are still learning, and they have to create that kind of credibility that will convince people in the long term that they are really worth the trust. The media. Will have a big role to play here. That uh, should not play along with that kind of fever. Mm-hmm. Should report it in depth. Should report stories that question mm-hmm. that question the real uh, impact of what they do. That's why I I think we should just suggest that how the media cover the new government should change. Mm-hmm. Not like in the past decades when government house reporters. Unquestioningly, will seek courts from the prime minister, from the ministers, and just report them word for word without questioning, yeah. without investigating whether what they said was right or wrong. It's I, known as hurt reporting, right? Hurt reporting. <laughs> I suggest that there should be a proper sort of press room where reporters, editors, columnists can sit down and question cabinet members. Ask in-depth question, asking in-depth questions, and really go deep into the issues instead of just headlines, headline stories. I think that will help because then the politicians cannot just say things that they are not responsible for, and then they forget about it. I think that is where the media will have to improve on its performance. Since we are on the issue of the media, one question that I often been asked. Especially by diplomats and our foreign journalist friends, and I'm sure that the same question must have been put to you quite often. The question is, how free are the media in Thailand, <laughs> especially under uh, General Prayut Chan Ocha the past eight years? Mm-hmm. My answer was that I, I don't have any real problem with press freedom. Mm-hmm. Of course, we are not happy with with the way that uh, the country was run by the Mitri h u n t a right? Mm-hmm. Uh, during which the time the the media was under a lot of pressure, but. Gradually, I think the atmosphere for the media has improved quite a lot, mm-hmm. and I would I would say that uh, we can report things quite uh, relatively f- freely on most issues. Of course, I I don't agree with the the idea that uh, 
the issue related to the monarchy should be used as the main yardstick in determining whether we are free or not, right? Yeah, because right. there are mm. other tons of issues that you can report on. Right. So what would you respond to uh, this kind of question? Well, we have not come under any direct threats mm. from the powers that be. But at the same time, the lack in free flow of information is an issue. The information, official information act, they call it, yeah. which is what constitutes the freedom of information. It's not working. When you want more information about certain stories, certain documents in the government possession, they can turn it down. I hope that this government, the new government, will change the law to make it compulsory for all government agencies to release information when asked. Should be only exceptions that are really sensitive issues mm -hmm. that can claim to be confidential. The rest should be open to all. I think, although it's you don't call it threat to press freedom, but you can call it uh, legal obstacles to mm -hmm. press freedom. I think that is where uh, the real improvement has to be made by the new government. We can be critical of the government, but at the same time, don't forget there is what they call it, information operation by the government <laughs> through social media, okay. all this fake news, false information, some of which I believe is produced by government agencies. And they have been doing be a better job than before, right? They been, yeah, they <laughs> have the new been proving. <laughs> yes. So I think that is where the threat to a free flow of information comes from. Okay. It's not the day, direct day-to-day -day reporting. Because now you have several factions, some pro-government, some anti-government, some pro-certain issue, then they would come up with their own stories, which, as long as they don't threaten the stability of the government, they can yes. still operate. Yeah. But I think that is not enough. Okay. Gun Chai, you were one of the early doomsayers of Thai mainstream media. Yes. You predicted long before most other people, yeah. many years back, that mm. in a distant future, yeah. and the mainstream media would die off and, and and we are now living in the future that you predicted. <laughs> yeah. Uh <-huh. laughs> right? Uh -huh. in, it, it's, a, it's a world that, mm. in which uh, newspapers have cross shops, right? Yeah, yeah. And uh, fewer and fewer people are watching TV and listening to radio. Mm -hmm. It's a world dominated by social media. Yes. And now you just say it has become one of the uh, mm -hmm. uh, news influencers on social media. Mm -hmm. So today, would you want to make another prediction? Uh -huh. <laughs> well, the prediction, my prediction now would be that that the change will continue and that AI will replace a lot of work that journalists are doing and that the way that people will consume or will receive information will change again. If AI becomes dominant, then we will be, it's not the channels of communications, it's not the platforms, it's the content mm -hmm. that will change so dramatically that we would not be able to di distinguish what, is, what are facts and what are lies. Mm. And that is more dangerous than the disruption that we, fa we have faced in the past two decades at least. That, were, that was platform's issue. Yeah. But the real challenge will be content, accuracy, content uh, issue. I think that is where we, as media people, as information consumers would have to be very, very careful. And that's where education is important. That's where the society must have its own watchdog groups to watch out for all these, uh, all these new developments that are still changing every day. So, Kun Chai, thank you very much. Most welcome.